Good morning. Welcome to Advent. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. How about starting off the worship with a hug? Welcome to Advent United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Eric Elkin, and this is my colleague, Pastor Cindy Yanchuri. We want to thank you on behalf of our entire staff and our community for joining us today for worship. Once again, though, we gather to give thanks and praise to God, carrying a heavy burden on our shoulders and in our hearts. Our, this was a very tense week. So I want to invite you now to center yourself in this moment, to calm yourself, relax, close your eyes, and repeat after me. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Transform my anxiety into hope. Transform my anxiety into hope. And make your presence known and make your presence known. Now I invite you to take whatever space you are worshiping in and make it a sacred space by lighting your candle. On this Trinity Sunday, we will be celebrating communion, so I hope you are preparing your bread of life and your cup of blessing at home, that it's there before you. But let us remember in the midst of it all, no matter where we are or how we are, our lives are bound together in this one God whom we know as the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of all life. May we always walk in this light together. Amen.
please join me in the call to worship. Come, heaven and earth, feel the power of God. We are the people of God. We feel that power. Come, great and small, and know that wherever we are, we stand in the presence of God. And so we center ourselves for this Sabbath time of worship. All right, let's get our hands and our feet ready to dance as we sing along to our theme song for the month of June. We are marching in the light of God. CYF staff, marching positions! And a one, a two, a one, two, three. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. One more time. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. Well, hi, everybody. Guess what? Today is a communion Sunday, and I'm so excited, Pastor Cindy, because last time I made some homemade bread, and I plan to make it again, and oh my gosh, it smells so you good. Know, that bread looked so good. <laughs> I could almost smell it through my TV. It, it looked that yummy. Um, oh, thank you for the compliment. Well, I'm really excited, but I don't have any grape juice. I'm all out. Well, on your way home today, I suggest you stop at the grocery store, pick up some grape juice, and then you'll have it for Communion Sunday. But I tell you what, Here's the deal, you mm -hmm. gotta make sure it's Welch's grape juice. No, I don't work for the Welch's grape juice company, but here's the thing. Many years ago, back a long time ago, when alcohol was a problem for a lot of people, Mrs. Welch went to her husband and said, can't you do something? He was already making grape jelly and grape jam. Can't you help us make some grape juice? Mrs. Welch was a Methodist, and Mr. Welch was too, and they developed Welch's grape juice. To this very day, most United Methodist churches will use Welch's grape juice as we honor that memory and that decision, and what it helps us do is make sure everybody who comes to the table, everyone is welcome. There is nothing that holds anyone back that's the story of why it's Welch's grape juice for communion. Well, that's a great story, and that means even kids can have communion. Even our children, the littlest of them, can join us at the table. That's wonderful. Should, should we pray, Pastor I Cindy? I think we better pray, don't you? Yes, I do too. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For the gift of people. For the gift of people. Who see a problem. Who see a problem. And decide to make a difference and decide to make a difference. Help me. Help me. Be someone. Be someone. Who makes a difference. Who makes a difference. Amen. 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 reading from Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 9. The Lord said to Abram, leave your land, your family, 
and your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Abram left just as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took his wife, Sari, his nephew Lot, all of their possessions, and those who became members of their household in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as the sacred place at Shechem at the Oak of Morah. The Canaanites lived in the land at that time. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I give this land to your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there, he traveled toward the mountains east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and worshiped in the Lord's name. Then they set out toward the arid southern plain, making and breaking camp as they went. This, this is, is the, the word, word of, of God, God for, for the, the people, people of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Today I'm preaching from the front yard of our friend's house, our friends Lon and Martha. This is a quiet and peaceful community and our friends have made a wonderful home here. I would bet if I talked with them and pressed them on the point, they would say that this house, this yard and this community is the first place that they really felt at home. Peggy and I have been friends with Lana and Martha for about 35 years. I'm here to talk about their journey to this place and how we walk together in that journey. The four of us are children of immigrants. Our ancestors crossed the Atlantic Ocean from different places in Europe and most likely for different reasons. Lana and I share a Norwegian heritage. Most likely our ancestors were farmers who could not find land to farm in Norway. They left their homeland because they were poor. They were starving and they had no hope of a future in Norway. Despite that common thread, Lon grew up in Duluth and I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Martha is Dutch and I'm not really sure of the circumstances of her family coming to this country. However, she found a home in Rochester, Minnesota. My wife's family are Mennonites with a German and Dutch background, but her family actually fled Russia to come to, the, to America. Peggy grew up surrounded by family in southwest Minnesota in a little town called Medilia. Our journey together began at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. Lon and I lived on the same floor my freshman year. That was the same year that I met Peggy. I met Martha my sophomore year living in the same dorm. At the time, the four of us shared the same community, but outside of my relationship with Peggy, we didn't really do a whole lot together. My junior year though, a professor invited me to go to New York for the summer. I knew Lon had worked at the same, had received the same invitation and had already made the journey. So we talked about his experience and he also invited me to go and I went. Then I married Peggy and invited her to go and she went. A year later, I recruited Martha to leave the land of her family behind and go to New York and she went. Our lives reflect the story of Sarah and Abraham because God invited Abraham and Sarah to go to a new land and they went. Lon, Martha, Peggy and I received an invitation from God through human witness to go and we went. The place we landed was Koinonia, a Lutheran camp and conference center and community in the Delaware River Valley of upstate New York. Like Abraham and Sarah, after responding to the invitation to go, we journeyed from one destination to the next. The four of us lived at Koinonia together, 
then moved to Brooklyn around the same time, then we moved to Pennsylvania around the same time, until we eventually returned back to the Midwest, ultimately to find a home in St. Paul. Yet even though it is both our ancestral land and a home for us because of our journey to get here, we often feel like Abraham and Sarah as strangers living in an alien land. <clears throat> Whenever I read the story of Abraham and Sarah, the most important lesson I want people to remember is this. God invited them to go and they went. The only protection they were taking for the journey was the promise of God that God will go with them and God will bless them wherever they go. Abraham and Sarah, who become the father and mother of the faith, never really find a land or home to settle in. They remain, they remain nomads journeying from one place to another. I would like to say they were perfect in the faith, but they were not. At times they trust and other times they abandon the promises of God. Perhaps it is better to describe them as models of our faith. Sometimes they were hot and sometimes they were cold. Their journey is marked by highs and lows. God makes a promise and Abraham and Sarah walk away. And then God returns and gives another promise and they get drawn back into it. Promise and walk away, promise and return. It's back and forth and back and forth. Lon and Martha have moved into a very quiet, and peaceful neighborhood. Their house, like our own, provides an oasis away from the burdens they deal with in their work life. It is to them a sanctuary away from what all that seeks to rob them of hope. It is a place that allows them to celebrate the gift of life. This past week, however, far away from the cameras recording events in Minneapolis, notes started appearing in the neighborhood's neighbor's yards. They were obviously all written by the same hand, yet they found their way into a multitude of homes. The houses that received the notes all had one thing in common. Each of them had a Black Lives Matter sign posted in their front yard. The notes all read, your neighbors are sick of riots and your SJW S-H-I-T. Your sign, Bull S-H-I-T, matters, comes down, or you and your home will burn quiet while you sleep in it. The notes serve to remind us there is no place of rest. There is no home away from hatred where violence ceases to threaten our neighbors. It reminded me the journey we walk is long and tiring and often exhausting. The one thing which makes the journey bearable is the promise of God to Abraham and Sarah. I will bless you and in you all families of the earth will be blessed. I would like to write a note for the person who sent the one to this neighborhood. This note would say something like this. We are all sick of the riots. We have been sick and tired of the riots for the last 52 years. Some of the riots you don't even know about. Those of us who work for or support social justice are tired of having to justify our existence to people who seek to rob others of freedom and hope. I want to write, we are tired of telling people like you that nothing in the slogan Black Lives Matter says that blue lives, white lives, or any other kind of life does not matter. Here's the problem with your threat. Our houses are already burning. If we don't say anything, who will come to save us? But thank you for the note. I, will now, I know now not to call you for help. May the peace of Christ find a way into your angry heart. Every Sunday morning when we worship in the sanctuary, Dan Simpson comes up to the person who's preaching that Sunday, whoever is preaching that Sunday, and gives them four quarters. It is one of my favorite quirky routines I've ever experienced in any congregation that I have served. I put the quarters in my car, 
and I leave them there and any time that I run into somebody on the street corner asking for money I take out the four quarters and I give it to them. On each quarter though there is a saying. In printed are the words E Pluribus Unum. It is Latin for out of many one. In 1782, an act of Congress included these words on the great seal of the nation. While it was never official, it did become the de facto slogan of the United States. In 1956, though, Congress made In God We Trust the official motto of the United States. And maybe this last move was a mistake. Maybe it diverted our attention away from our mission in an unintended way. Not suggesting in God we trust is wrong or bad. Truthfully, I'm out of a job without it. <laughs> in God we trust has become so divisive. I do, you don't. Who trusts the God? Who trusts God? Who determines that who believes and trusts in God? If the Christian church argues over what this means, how can a nation hope to find agreement as well. E pluribus unum, out of many one, reminds us of the long difficult journey our founders decided to take. They invited us to join the hike. Like Abraham and Sarah waiting for a child, we have forgotten our ultimate destination. We are and we will be many, but we need to also be one. Out of many people, one law out of many opinions, one community, out of many paths, one destination, a place where all people are created equal and there will be justice and liberty for all. As I look at Lon and Martha's house, I realize our journey is near an end. Not that we are nearing death in any way, but our days of traveling to distant places to live are over. We have found our resting spot and the time to journey is our children's. And even though we have found our resting spot, we must still walk. If we commit ourselves to blessing all of Abraham's and Sarah's children, they will all live in a peaceful neighborhood and we will give thanks for the blessing of the journey. I have to keep reminding myself that Abraham and Sarah journeyed out into the wilderness. Their hikes were filled with peaks and valleys, joys and sorrows, pain and love. Yet, no matter what the condition of their hike, it was guided by a promise and a blessing of God and the promise and blessing of God's presence. And so is ours. Don't be blind to the truth as you take that hike this day. Amen.
Offering is more than a time in worship where we collect money. It is when we invite you to make a specific gesture of gratitude for all that has been given to you, your time, your talents, your treasures, signs of God's gracious love. The flowers on this altar area are one specific and unique offering made this day by Alona Spencer, celebrating her husband Grant's ministry with the youth of this congregation. She wrote a note in this offering that said, Grant, you have such a soul for Christ. While I suspect Alona is a little biased in this area, her assessment of Grant's gifts are real. Anyone who has worked with Grant knows he has a soul for Christ. This weekend was supposed to be Grant's ordination, his official ordination in front of the gathering of colleagues in Christ. Like so many things, though, COVID-19 changed these plans. So perhaps you might send a greeting his way as a sign of gratitude for his ministry. Since we cannot pass the offering plates this day in our virtual worship experience, we invite you and those who are worshiping with us to give electronically. You can give by clicking the link on the YouTube page below this video. Unplanned gifts collected during offering time is a significant source of income for this congregation. It helps us sustain the ministry and provide wonderful servants like Grant for the world. So please consider taking a moment now to give, perhaps $5, $10, out of gratitude and in service to the need of the needs of the world. Thank you. Almighty and gracious God, we offer a portion of what you have first given to us. Receive our gifts, receive us. Accept from us our willingness to serve you and to do your work in this world. And now as we enter into our time of prayer, we ask that you would transform us, change us so we might truly be your people as we humbly come before you with our joys and our concerns, let us pray. Holy and gracious God, as we gather, we know there are so many who are in need of healing. This week, we have heard lifted up prayers for Dan, Leo, Julie, Adam, Ellie, Marilyn, and Matthew. Hold them, hold their families, and let them know that we pray as you are holding them. Gracious God, for all those waiting to hear, waiting to hear test results, waiting to hear from family, waiting to hear from friends, waiting, all of us who sit and wait. Gracious God, we come before you praying for those who are living in 
facilities where there needs to be extra care. We pray for any and all this day who are in pain, whether it is physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, we lift before you those who are in pain. We pray for Brad as he mourns the loss of his father and for all those who have experienced a loss and know the heartache of not being able to celebrate that loss in the way they would have wanted. Gracious God, for a, a, a wonderful nephew, Craig, who was recently diagnosed with cancer, we pray. We pray for peace and justice to abound. You call us to be those people. You call us to be the people who work for justice. You call us, you beg us to be kind and to walk humbly. And so it is, gracious God, that we pray for our communities, for our cities, for those who are in despair, for those who are mourning, for those who are brokenhearted. This day as we gather, we are reminded as well that we are people of joy. And so with Gary and Pam, we celebrate our wedding anniversary. We celebrate birthdays. We give thanks for the opportunity we have to worship in this way, to stay connected. And as so many of you have offered up prayers of gratitude for the staff, just know that your staff is praying for you. We hold each other up. We hold each other up in the blessing and the boundless joy that comes because we walk in the way of Jesus. So as we walk, we pray in the way he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to gather around the communion table to feast on this meal of life, we need to take a moment to um, recognize and dedicate these memorial gifts that have been given in honor of two absolutely wonderful members of this congregation. The pottery you see here is given in memory of both John Childers and Wayne Murphy. John Childers is a charter member of Advent Church and in retirement took up pottery. I have many of his pieces and cherish them. And we felt that in his memory, it was only fitting to ask a friend of his, Jerry, to make us new communion ware. And so we celebrate John's memory today and this new communion ware. Wayne and uh, Marvel, as we know, are just two wonderful people that would sit in this congregation and just enjoyed so much to be here and be present among this community. And Wayne just loved coming to this table um, to feast on this heavenly meal and to be renewed in spirit and in life from all the gifts that God pours out on us. So we remember this day, uh, Wayne and John, and let us take this moment now to pray over this communion ware. Gracious God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these elements and may they continue to be um, used in your service to help others understand your abiding presence in their life, that this table is a place to come and be renewed in life and to eat and drink this life from these, from this communion where may you watch over them, may you guide us that use them, and may you lead us all forward in hope, in joy, in love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Over the past two months, there has been much conversation about how to be the church in a time of pandemic. Specifically, as we seek to be good stewards of the lives entrusted into our care, you, how should we gather to worship? How do we embrace each other in peace and how can we share the table of the Lord? This conversation has only intensified this past week as our nation erupted in protests about racial equality and justice. Many are asking, how do we deal with this issue? How do we move forward? Where is God in the midst of all this violence? As I was reading one of the lectionary scriptures for Pentecost, one line really jumped out at me in the story of Doubting Thomas. It came from John chapter 20, verse 26. It says, even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered in and stood among them. We would do well to remember these words today in worship. They should be on our lips as we move out into the world, as it reopens, and as we head into an uncertain future. Jesus enters and stands among us, even when the doors of our hearts, our homes, and our lives are locked. It is in this spirit and understanding that we celebrate Holy Communion and share the gifts of the table today. A virtual sharing of communion is also a good time to remember the United Methodist understanding of this meal. We believe through Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, God meets us at the table. Christ is present through the community gathered in Jesus' name, even if that gathering is viral. Christ is present through the word proclaimed and enacted. Let those with ears hear. And it is Christ who is present through the elements of bread and cup shared. You may be saying to yourself, how can Christ be present in a hundred or more different loaves of bread all at once or in a hundred or more cups spread throughout Egan, Minnesota and far beyond all at the same time? Shouldn't we be breaking bread from the same loaf and drinking from the same cup? We believe that every Sunday morning, wherever Holy Communion is celebrated, Christ is present. Christ is present at Easter Lutheran Church, as well as Advent United Methodist Church. Christ is present at St. Martha and Mary Episcopal Church and St. John Newman Catholic Church. None of those churches share the same loaf of bread or the same cup. As we speak the words of Holy Communion, remember the words of John. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered in and stood among them. As we get ready to gather around the table of grace, I invite you at home to prepare your meal. So as we celebrate Holy Communion, we do it together. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed the breath of life into us. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to our church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on those who are gathered wherever they might be and pour out your Spirit upon these gifts at their table. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, in all honor and glory is yours, almighty creator, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So here's a few announcements I want to share with you. We have a charge conference coming up on Tuesday, June 16th. This will be a Zoom meeting. If you'd like to attend, be sure to email the office to receive the Zoom link. There's a whole bunch of opportunities coming up to connect here at Advent, both online and in person. Check the website in the description below for more information. And now, here's a very special announcement from Mr. Chris and Miss Ariel. Chris, 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 Chris! What? Guess what? What? Summer isn't canceled. What? Yes, that's right! Summer isn't canceled. Isn't what? that exciting? That's so exciting. Right. Well, we know uh, Faith Builders and other awesome people who might do some summer camp type stuff that things are a little uncertain and a little weird right now with everything going on. However, here at Advent, we are so excited to announce that we are going to have some kind of summer camp. So you can join myself, 
and Mr. Chris and some of our other awesome, wonderful CYF staff on Wednesdays from 9.30 to 11.30 for some outdoor fun time right here in the Big Backyard. We're going to have a couple of different themes. Every session is only $5, so go ahead and you can sign up using the link below. We can't wait to see you this summer. Our call to action this morning is about walking the Bible. Our series for June is about that very thing. The stories you'll hear as we take that walk. But one of the things we can do, even during this season, is to walk outside. I encourage you to walk and to pray. The adult faith team has created a series of resources that you can use as you walk. We have a series called The Path of Love, The Path of Peace, The Path of Justice, and Walking the Psalms. These little booklets are going to be right outside the church, located on a table in this weatherproof container. All you have to do is write your name down that you took one, and make sure you bring it back so that others might enjoy. If we run out, don't worry, we know how to make more. But please join me in walking the Bible walking for peace, walking with love, and walking for justice as we make our way through the Psalms. Today, as you go forth, may you walk in the light of Christ, and every day may you walk in the light of Christ, walking in the way of love, peace, and justice. Amen. Yeah. 